Kelly is a coach, a mentor, a creative thinker, a leader, and an inspiring speaker. And I'm confident you will find her address both practical and inspiring. Um, when we hear the words team building, I'm sure a lot of you think about those days when you all go out and build a raft together and, and have a great time and take it across the river and get a bit wet and sing Kumbaya on the other side and pretend you're all friends again on Monday. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with those sorts of team building exercises when you have a functioning team that needs to let off a bit of steam and have a bit of fun. But when you have a highly dysfunctional team, um, those things, um, you're frightened someone's going to drown you as you go across the creek. And, and I have people come to training with me, team, team building, I like to call it team development, um, that they come along and they'll want to know, you know, do we, do we have any trust exercises and, and I'm not catching him and if I've got a group of blokey blokes, um, by the way, I'm not politically correct in any way, shape or form, just putting it out there, right? I, mean, I, call, I don't use buzzwords, um, so if you've got one of those buzzword bingo things, you know, train this buzzword bingo has been around for a few years, I'm hoping I have used very few words on that as well. Uh, as Jan said, I call it like it is. But I have, sometimes have the blokey blokes. I've done quite a bit of work recently in the mining industry. I've done work for Boeing and quite a diverse range of clients. And they sort of come in and we've got this Sheila out the front and they're not too sure what's going to happen. And, go, oh, do we have to have a group hug? I'm like, oh, well, if you want to, you know, it's okay. Don't feel like you have to, but they're not touching me. So, so you know, it's, uh, it's entirely up to you. If you guys want to kind of get together and have hugs, no, there's nothing wrong with that. So what I'm going to talk about today are some of the real world challenges that we have. How often do you go to training, whether it's leadership or otherwise, or you read the leadership books, and you look at it and you see, yes, that's all very good, here's how a team works. You have the forming and the storming and the norming and the performing. And you think back at the team you're currently in, or one of the teams in HR that you have to deal with, you know, that takes up a lot of your brain space, one of the teams in your organisation, and they've never left the storming stage. And you sit there going, that's lovely, how can I apply this to Mary Sue with that defective personality? Hey, I said I wouldn't be political. Um, or, or the person who just doesn't show up on a regular basis and I know if they get challenged or if we have um, a counselling conversation with them, they won't turn up for the next three weeks. And so we won't have the counselling conversation because we desperately need their particular technical skill so we put up with a lot of their nonsense because we really need them. And there's a big skills shortage, blah, 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 blah. And there's all these fantastic reasons why we don't have the real conversations with people. A lot of the time in HR, you want to have the real conversations, but the conversation you have to have is with the manager, and sometimes you'd like to hit the manager or team leader or coordinator there with a frying pan to get them to have the conversation six months ago, so you, what didn't land in your lap today? How am I going so far? <laughs> Pretty close to the mark? Right. So this morning's session, and I'm going to call this session, it's not just, just going to be a keynote, where it, it's workshop style. So don't wait till you get to the end and see if you've got any questions. If you have any concerns or disagree with me, I, I have no problem with that. Uh, if you want to interject and ask a question throughout the session, I'm fine. If I'm on a real roll, I'll continue to give me a second. But, um, and if you have a specific issue, sometimes people have a burning issue and they want to really drill down on that. We won't have time for that this morning, but I will be hanging around in a couple of the breaks so if you want to come and talk to me. Um, you know, if, if now's not the place for it, um, we can talk about it a little bit later. I'm going to um, give uh, you two case studies, and I've got a handout that will go out in a moment. Uh, where we'll look at two particular case studies. Now, in case you, as I'm talking, you're wondering, oh, is that where my sister works, or did I used to work there? Neither of them are local. As Jan said, I'm, I know Newcastle, right? <laughs> I wouldn't even touch on one that was vaguely resembling anything in Newcastle because there's about three degrees of separation in this, in this city. 
So, um, so yes, they're both from out of town. As Jan said, I've worked in over 80 towns and cities across Australia. I thought it was about 40, and I was working in Cobar last year. And one of the guys said to me, because I said something all about you know working in this town, and when I was in Carrara, he was like, "How many places you worked?" I said, oh, "Probably about I don't know, 30 or 40." Well, it was pretty riveting in Cobar at the time because they didn't have digital television, and um, there wasn't a whole lot on. And I sat down this night and went back over the last 15 years and sort of went state by state, and I got up to 83. And Lucky travels okay. So I'm going to give the, the, um, the two case studies. I'm going to talk about some of the causes for dysfunction, so you can maybe spot some of the early warning signs. Um, as HR professionals, you probably see them a lot earlier than other people do. But you often have a challenge on how you get that message across and how as a sort of kind of get along under the team lead or the manager or the senior management or whoever on board to do so I'm also going to give you some tips and suggestions on what you can do going forward. For starters, let's have a look at the cost of um, a, a poor performing team, the cost of dysfunction. When we look at dysfunction, um, it, it's a team that's not working well. Now quite often, uh, you might not get through to the manager or the supervisor that the team's having a problem staff are all coming to you and you're hearing the grumblings and you can feel a, um, a grievance coming through formally very soon, you're starting to notice absenteeism, all of those things that happen when a team's not functioning well, but you mention it to the manager or you mention it to the director who remember and say, I think we've got a problem here, and their response is, no, they need all their KPIs. That doesn't mean that that's actually going to work long term, it's not sustainable. So if they're ticking all of the technical boxes, that's lovely now. That makes someone's report to the board or to um, senior management look okay. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't um, make your life and the people in the team's life easier. So some of the things that occur um, is low morale. One of the things I do in the team building days is I get the team to measure morale. Um, it's a very complex uh, process. I developed it one day in a flash when it was all going very pear shaped and they were all whinging about morale and I thought alright, I often develop things in a flash when it's all going very pear shaped and I think damn that was good, I'm doing that again. So morale, my very complex morale indicator is I walked around this day and I give everyone a piece of blank paper and then I get them to write on it. Oh, but today I'm exposing some of my IP with you guys. I'm putting it out there. But I, I don't believe in presenters coming along and telling you this much of what they can do and buy my book. Mm -hmm. I don't have a book. So I'm here to tell you what, what, um, what is going to help you do today. So the morale indicator. You have a piece of paper. I get them to write down how they would rate morale currently out of 10. 10 is I love my job and I skip to work every day. One is, you know, I want to neck myself or I've got my um, <laughs> resume out there everywhere, right? So you measure where morale is. And then next to it, I get them to write a number of where they would like morale to be and put a circle around that number. Where would you like morale to be? And then I get them to fold it up and I collect all the bits of paper. So it's an strictly anonymous this, you know, really bad teams, I'm talking about some of the really bad teams, I'm sure you've had plenty of yourself, and they write it down, and I collect all of the bits of paper, and I do a team average. And uh, and that's quite a challenging thing, and then that gives us a place to work on from there. So, low morale is an issue. When you have low morale, what else happens? Sorry? Absenteeism, high absenteeism, what else happens? Low productivity, poor performance, conflict. Po sorry? Conflict. conflict, 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 conflict. Workers' complaints start to come, people go on stress leave. Customer service goes down the toilet. It might be customer service, your customers might all be internal, 
but the customer service goes down the toilet. So it doesn't just impact on that team, it impacts on other teams. HR managers get migraines. You know, <laughs> HR people spend all of their time dealing with things that they could otherwise, that you know, could be time in things that they could otherwise do, but more productive efforts into. Thinking, I'm sure you're thinking about particular teams and situations in your workplace now and how much time that takes up. And, and you almost feel like the broken record syndrome because you're having the same conversations with the same people over and over again. And you know what Einstein said about that. It's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing the same way over and over again, expecting a different result. And unfortunately, in our workplace now, hitting people over the head with a frying pan is pretty unacceptable. I've worked in lots of different areas, haven't found one where you can get away with the head, so, so we need to find other ways. Um, the grievance levels become really high. You know, there's claims of bullying and counterclaims, and the, this person says the supervisor's bullying, and then the bully puts in a, the supervisor puts a counterclaim in, and no one quite understands what bullying really is, but everyone's really unhappy. Um, anything else you can add to that list? No? Resignation. You lose good people. The bad ones don't go anywhere. <laughs> we try really hard, but they don't go anywhere. Now, I don't have a guarantee with my sessions that I'll get rid of the bad ones. See, that's so politically incorrect to say something's a bad stuff, and you know it. Be challenging ones. Um, I don't guarantee it, but sometimes, if it works well, you can pull the team together so they are so strong that they suddenly decide, do you know what? We're not accepting that behaviour from you anymore. And so if I can't turn that person, or I can't help the supervisor or manager turn that person, what we do is we work on the rest of the team, and the goal is for them to decide what they will and won't accept within their team environment. So we strengthen and empower the team. But, uh, and then sometimes the bad person will lose. I've had a couple of thank you cards over the years because someone's so left. Uh, it's, not, it's not part of the money back guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> I can't guarantee. It. My goal is to make sure you good people stay and that you good people can do the job that they have to do. Um, dealing with challenges takes work and it takes a lot of time and energy. It doesn't magically happen. Now, on your handouts, um, are, there's just three pages, but on one of the pages, I've got some recommended readings, some books that I, I strongly recommend if you haven't read them, they are particularly helpful in this area. And uh, Susan Scott's Fierce Conversations is one of them. And I love what she's got in that book, Have You Ever Witnessed a Spontaneous Recovery from <laughs> so doing nothing actually doesn't make a difference at all. Hoping it will go away doesn't make a difference at all. It's going to take work. You're going to have to be tough. You need to be fair, but you have to be tough. And fair is an interesting word. A lot of people say that it's not fair if we have to do this. It's not fair if I have to go and work in that team. I'm reminded of and I can't remember who said it. I'm a quote a My name is Kelly and I'm a quote a um, but, but a particular quote I read years ago, um, thinking that the world will treat you fairly because you're a good person is like hoping the bull won't charge you because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Life's not necessarily fair. But what you need to be able to do is work with your own values, your own ethics, stick with what you know is right, and with the organisational values and ethics. The organisational values should be more than a fabulous plaque on the wall in reception or something on the back of the loo door. Uh, most times when I talk to organisations um, as part of the leadership programs and we, we dig into the, the values and I'll say, so what are your core team organisational values? And you can hear the crickets in the background. And people go, I think there's five, um, I think integrity is one of them. You know, and that's that's ridiculous. It's the organisational values that will work better than any policy and procedure in 
helping you deal with some of these behaviours. We run around trying to write a policy for this and a policy for that, when if you have your core values right and everyone lives those values, that's your measuring stick to bring people back to, you know, the, if, if teamwork is one of your core values, an organisation I'm working for now, um, uh, developing our people is one of their core values. So that's a great way that uh, managers can work with their supervisors and say, when you don't share knowledge, that's not part of one of our core values. Or if it's teamwork, when you consistently don't turn up to work and don't let people know and you're not coming because you're in a bad mood or you know the cat's sick again or whatever, uh, that's letting the team down, it's not one of our core values. So I'm always surprised, to me, it seems very simple. So I'm always surprised when organisations don't live, eat, breathe the values. There's one uh, company uh, locally and they, um, they live their values and they only have three. And I love it when an organisation has three core values and everything else feeds off that, you can remember three. You can't remember 12 or eight. Most people are pushing it to remember five. But they have it and they, their logo is actually um, symbolic of the values. The logo doesn't actually say anything about what the business does. But every single staff member knows because they're taught that in induction, and let me tell you about inductions in a moment, but every single staff member knows that they are the core values and how they have to live and work them. So I'm not saying they don't have problems, but they have that tool to help them deal with the problems, measurement tool. Um, inductions is, is one of probably the bane, probably the bane of your existence um, with most organisations. And unfortunately, because we usually need people and we need them three weeks ago or six months ago if it's a, an area where there's a real school, school shortage, when people come along, the inductions are often short, sharp and shiny, other than the safety ones. The safety ones are, um, are more complex. But your average person coming into a new job, they find out of what the company values are, they learn about some of the policies. The same day, they're learning where the loo is and how to use the phone and how far away they the local cafe is. And what are they going to remember first? You know. So if it's not if it's not embedded in what you do, if values aren't talked about, um, just saying that you did it in induction or it's in our induction book, I hear that all the time, it's in our staff manual. Yeah, that, that's great. You tell me what's in it. And even the people who wrote it a lot of time can't remember. So that needs to be part of the process. Susan Scott also says, as a leader, you get what you tolerate. As a leader, you get what you tolerate. We might hand over some case studies out now. I'm going to um, go through some case studies, and they're, they're two teams that I've worked with. They're slightly different teams, and we're going to. I'm going to talk to you about what the challenges were, and then what we did to uh, fix them. And we had great success with both of them. itself had also been through a big change management process. 
There were multiple personality clashes, not multiple personalities. <laughs> <laughs> well, some. Um, but, but the clashes, they were all allowed to impact the team. Staff issues were regularly swept under the carpet, minimised or ignored. And when the staff did the very complex morale test, they rated it 4 out of 10. Um, some of the staff had been moved sideways and numerous roles had changed and there was lots of confusion. <coughs> there was a big divide between qualified and non-qualified staff. There was some staff, some of the, the long-term staff, been there 20 odd years, they didn't have the same quals as some of the newer ones, but they had lots of experience and they've been doing the jobs for a long time. The newer ones coming in seem to get better uh, opportunities, so you can imagine how happy that made them. The staff that were doing the high-end preferred work, the less boring work, they were seen as teachers' pets. Um, there were multiple grievances lodged against the other staff management and the organisation. Two unions were heavily involved as staff didn't communicate with management, they went straight to the union. HR was ready to throw their hands in the air. The HR, um, it wasn't the HR manager, it was the L&D manager at the time, <coughs> was fairly new to the organisation. She'd heard about this team. She'd been told that they had um, people that they would use regularly, other consultants who'd said, look, I'd give up with these guys. Now, um, she was in this meeting and they said, there's no one who can fix this. Who are you going to call? Um, I, she, the way she <laughs> described me was, look, I know someone, she's a really sick puppy, but she actually loves this stuff. So we'll give her a go. My husband thinks I'm a sick puppy. I remember years ago we were in a, um, a meeting with an HR manager and Gary was doing some work for her and I was going to be doing some work. And she was talking to me about a really, really dysfunctional team and the behaviours. And he said, I'm sitting here going, oh, I wouldn't want to be in the same room as these people. And he said, well, look at you, you're almost salivating. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a sickness, but... <laughs> the interesting thing with this team, this team is so tough. I'm not saying that I cruise into the room and feel happy and comfortable. I, I go in with, with my main game on and they are very challenging and I've had some real challenges over the years. This particular group, the, the level of um, disgusting behaviour that occurred within the team was, was really high. Uh, three, a week or so before I um, was doing the first day with these people, I had a, um, a large skin cancer removed from my chest and I only just had the stitches out so I had this big welt thing with, you know, all hideous looking right here. So doing the big girl thing that morning, I was trying to put a scarf around it and hide it, you know, some baby like we all are. And Gary, Gary walked in and went, nah, show me a scarf. So I thought, <laughs> and so I thought, all right, game on. So I walked into the room, the scar, you know, I'm so tough, you should have seen the other day. So what did we do in this situation? One of the crucial things to working with any team and, and for you working with any team is to make sure you have management on board. And I mean really on board, not paying for service. Again, if we have the frying pan, that would be great. But this, this, we have a fairly new senior manager and uh, he had inherited this team and he wanted to do something. So I had numerous meetings with him and I was fully briefed. You need the manager to fully brief you, not just tell you the bits that don't make them look too inadequate. So he, he briefed me on the whole game going in there. And he worked closely with me. He sat in the room on the day. He asked my advice, should I be in the room when we do the, the training or should I not be? And I said, I think you need to be there, uh, but you need to zip your lip unless I tell you. And so I always get that confirmation and you guys need to do the same. You need to decide who's going to be good cop and who's going to be bad cop and how it's going to work. So I got, got him on board. Um, we, there was some concern that the unions would have an issue because of the level of um, formal grievances that were going on. The unions um, were, they were concerned that the unions would stop people from coming. You know, recommend to, because we had a lot of, um, delegates involved in the team and they were concerned that they would stop them from coming. 
shortcomings, and I said, I'm happy to meet with the unions. What I'm doing isn't about the grievances, mine's about their daily behaviour going forward. I'm not touching it, I won't be talking about it in that, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going in that. So I let them see my rough outline for the day and, and gave the option. They didn't follow me up, but that was fine. When I first start the day, I go around the room, I do a little icebreaker activity, and I get everyone to introduce themselves to me. But then I make them be present in the room. Now, I know Charlotte's going to be here this afternoon talking about mindfulness and being present. I make people be present and mindful and in the room and own their own experience. So I to ask them to tell me as we go around the room, what would you like to get out of today? Here's what we're here for. I don't, I don't fluff it up. I used to in the old days try and let, you know, make it all sweet and um, that didn't work. So I go, we're here because it's not working so well. So what would you like to get out of the day? And from that I start to see who's going to be my smart aleck, who's, um, you know, um, doesn't want to play, who's terrified of the person across the room because you're watching all of that all the time. And I got part way around the room and usually at that stage people go, oh, I just like to get to know my workers. And, you know, I just like us to all work together and they kind of minimise it because they're all a bit scared to say the first thing. The room's in a U shape. We get part way around the room, this bloke directly <coughs> his head with some very colourful language. He said, Well, I'd like to see us F and work together. I'd like to F and stop the F and this and this and this and blah, blah, blah. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Game on. All right. <laughs> And the first thing I did was I thanked him and I said, fantastic. Thank you for your honesty. You've named the elephant in the room. You want it better. This is great. Up from here. This is good. Your name is great. Shook his hand and said, thanks very much. <coughs> By the way, it's not up to me to fix it. It's your team. I'll go home tonight and still sleep tonight. It's your team. You're the ones who need to fix it. And so you have to get people to take ownership. They make it HR's problem. They make it the manager's problem. Are you working in that team? Did you cause the problem? No, you didn't. So you need to make them take ownership for it. I always use um, Belbin and Belbin Team Role Theory is great. There are some fantastic tools. There's, there's lots of great tools out there. The reason I use Belbin is it's about the team because it looks at the preferred working style in the team environment and it highlights how we're different, why we annoy each other, but it brings it back to how we're going to get the team to work. So that's that's what I do. So I gain agreement right at the start, and usually that's the first thing, and you can do that yourselves with teams, is get them to agree that they're not happy. And when they start to this, all you need is one person to um, get the ball rolling saying, I want to be happy coming to work. And then everyone else will agree, I want to be happy coming to work. I love my job, but I hate coming here. I feel sick coming here, you know? Um, so once you've gained that agreement, agree that we're not happy, fantastic, then we move forward from there. Um, the morale, as I said, was four out of 10. Then you get them to list the issues, why morale is poor. And I get them to do it in groups. Why is morale poor? And this is where you have to hold type the, the manager or the supervisor and let them just let it flow. Because you have to let them purge. And we put all the stuff up on the whiteboard or the butcher's paper. Here's all the reasons. And one of the reasons might be that the um, building faces the west and I don't like the view, right? So we get all the stuff on the board and then we go, can we do anything about turning the building around? No, well, let's rub this one off. Can we do anything about personality clashes? Yes, we can, we'll leave that one. We put all of the things there. And then I get them to work as a group in their little groups and come up with solutions. Because a lot of the time, HR, management, other people come in and go, here's what you need to do. And they all nod and smile and don't do any of it. They have to own the solutions. So, so one of the things you need to be doing, uh, uh, 
particularly in the HR space, is ask more questions to make people accountable. What are you? What would you like to do? What would you like to see it be like? What kind of team environment? Now, sometimes I'll say, let's get all the issues out there. What's causing the problem? <laughs> sometimes I don't use morale. If it's not, if it's a niggly thing, I can tell there's a problem. But the manager said they're not too bad, and they won't own up and say, oh no, we're all happy. Then I talk about what would be a perfect working environment, and then how is it now? And then what can you do to change? There's a whole lot of different ways that I will approach this. But all of it is about, let's get a bit of blood on the floor, let's get the issues out there, let's talk about what's really bothering us, and then let's find the solutions. And if you find that every second thing that's coming back, uh, and, I, and this is where I get in their face, every second thing that comes back, well, management and do, no, no, that, that, no, not management, what can you do? All right, let's look at what we can do versus what we can't do. Management are going to hear about this and they're on board because I'm going to be meeting with them. But what can you do? This isn't management didn't cause all of this. Management made some decisions you weren't happy with and your behaviours reflect that displeasure. But you're still responsible for your own. <coughs> so it's all about making people accountable. And we've become too scared to do that, haven't we? We struggle to make people because what if they do this and what if they put in a complaint? Well, I'm sure as HR professionals, you know that the real side of what actual bullying is and what harassment is. And making people accountable for what they're doing is not bullying or harassment if it's done in an appropriate way. So we need to stop being so scared. We need to have real conversations. The other thing that we did, we did the first day and the group workshops and solutions. And then they discussed, we, we got, I got them to look at what did they need in order to make these solutions happen. What do they need from their manager? What do they need from each other? And then I asked the manager and supervisors, what do you need from the team in order to have it? So it's sort of like a full 360 thing. We all need something here. The manager's going, I can do this for you, but I need this to come back from you. I, I need so again, it's about the accountability. So by the end of the first day, we will have um, some sort of commitment to change going forward. And we document that and we send it back and then they have that. Then I work with the manager to get them on board to make that process continue. The great thing that the senior manager did is he then organised me, because I never just do it one day, you can't fix something like this in one day. You've got to come back a couple of months later. And, and check in. But um, in between, I worked with all of the senior people. Anyone who did an acting um, position, supervisor position, and the supervisors, coordinators, all of those people that were responsible for allowing this to happen, I did some leadership training with them and got them on board. And they felt empowered rather than um, you know, stuck in and part of the process. Then we went back. In this case, it was nearly three months later, and I brought out that first list of reasons for poor morale, why they hated coming to work. And when you do that a couple of months down the track, they're actually blown away thinking, wow, were we really that bad? Now, when they did it the second time, the, um, they checked morale again and it had gone up to a seven. So from a four to a seven was really good. And then we talk about what they want to do. But you could feel the buzz in the air. I know. Being Australian, and when I'm working in Australia, you know when a group of people get on because they're all taking the mickey out of each other. So there was the humour, they were, the, they were comfortable enough to have a joke and, and, and poke fun at each other. And it, what, there was no nastiness attached, it was, it was that, that way that we, we communicate. So, so they, they got to that stage. Uh, in the second day, I also use the, the Genos Motivational Tool and we look at what motivates uh, the individual, what sort of role, uh, management style, organisation and team motivates the individuals. Again, what we want to do is highlight the differences to make, and for people to see that we're different, we're not necessarily wrong. So we see things differently. <coughs> uh, this, this to, and, and because they had come so far, we had some fun team activities. We didn't build a raft or hug each other, but a few team activities that built around communication, having the fun. But I found if you take too many games in on day one, 
the real issues never come out. So that's what I've learned probably the hard way over the years, and that's what's most effective. Does anyone have any questions in regard to that first one? No? Okay. The second case study uh, was an Aboriginal unit in a government department. There were eight people in the team. They were all female, and only two of them were non-Aboriginal. They worked in a small to medium regional community. When, when, with, with the Aboriginal community, they face a whole range of other challenges that we may not face, um, non-Aboriginal people, because there are a lot of family pressures, external family pressures, put on the staff. And in this particular area, they were providing a service to the Aboriginal community, so there were extra pressures. They would have people, family members or neighbours or our aunts were having come and knock on their door expecting <coughs> that they, they couldn't do. So they had have a, a different level of stress and challenges that they may really experience. Um, two of the staff were cousins, and the previous manager was the mother of one and the aunt of the other, and there was a big family feud. Um, strong community ties for most of the staff, and there were two very strong alliances that split the team, and the cousins were on either side. They weren't necessarily the ringleaders, but, but their relationship had been torn by the issues in the workplace. There were bullying and harassment claims from both sides. There were also unofficial claims of racism. No one had put in a formal complaint, but that was, was a word that got fairly about by both sides, by the Aboriginal staff and by the white staff that were working in that team. Um, there was poor attendance, and the workers' compensation claims were due to stress were really common. And I mean poor attendance. They went for six months without one full week of a full group of staff. So you can imagine productivity. You can imagine the stress placed on the other staff because people were turning it, because they just couldn't do it. Um, most of the communication was via email, and they worked in adjoining pods, you know, here and here, and they would email each other. And the two factions weren't in two separate pods, they were spread between the pods, uh, you could cut the air with a knife, and, um, and, and they would email each other, and they, they wouldn't speak. And the regional manager was regularly cc in on nearly everything. You know, um, I, I, if one person was telling someone to do something, they'd cc the regional manager, because they, they'd given up on the manager. And the poor manager, um, that the previous manager I worked with her, and, and she was a bit sensitive, but she was too close to the problem. They brought in, uh, she moved sideways to another area, and they brought in another manager, and there was a new acting regional manager who went, this is taking up far too much of my time. She looked after a large part of the state. I need to do something. So we, um, again, I was fully briefed. I was sent volumes of um, information on the claims and counterclaims so I understood really what was happening. If you get a consultant in and you give them this much information, the success they're going to give you will be greatly minimised. You need to trust whoever you're using and, and let them know what's really happening, regardless of how bad they can get. Question Yeah. What about bias? What if your problem is a manager of the same type of information? Uh, a lot of the time they are, and that's a great question. A lot of the time they are, and um, you can see through it. So what you do is you start to make them accountable. So what are you doing about it? Just keep asking that question. So what did you do there? Was that the most appropriate way to deal with that situation? I have lots of managers that, that's, that blame the team, and I walk in the room, and the team's actually not too bad. The manager needs shooting, you know. <laughs> They, they, it's, it's the problem. So, so you, you are aware that there is a bias at times, and you call them on it. And, and that's not always easy. Um, the, um, again, we, we started the team day, and the interesting thing was, when we went around the room, they were kind of pouring their hearts out. They, they, that some of them started crying when we just went around the room, you know, introduce yourself. They were so nervous, they were terrified, a lot of them, you know, 
team building day, they have no idea what's going to happen. I tell them to don't send the agenda because I might change it on the day because it needs to change. So people get very scared about that, but I'm okay with that because we need to start from scratch and, and, and um, Their morale was um, three out of 10. Actually, it's 2.8. Uh, out, of, out of 10, but we agreed that um, they needed to change. And, and so when, when I went, and, I, and as we go around the room, I write down what they all want to get out of today, and then I sit there and I read it back to them. This, this, this. Can you see there's a strong message here? You all want the same thing. You must hate coming to work. This must be horrible for you, so let's fix it. So straight away, it's not me against them, it's come on, team, let's fix this. So um, we looked, again, the, the workshop, the solutions, um, the reasons for the Pomerale, the workshop, the solutions. And um, the simple things that we did is we looked at the commitment they were going to make going forward. And for them, one of the main commitments that they made, two key things they did, they agreed that when they came in the, in the morning, they would say hello to each other. And when they left of an afternoon, they would say goodbye to each other and they would have a weekly meeting and they would all turn up to the weekly meeting. That's how basic we had to go. But to get them to agree to say hello to each other took a whole day. Then the thing we did there, we didn't do um, uh, coaching, uh, didn't do, sorry, uh, training with the guys in between like they did before leadership training. I did some one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. So I went out to this town. Um, we did the training on the Tuesday and on the Wednesday. I did back to, and the Thursday I did back-to-back -back coaching appointments with every staff member, getting them on board. What did they see was a problem? Were they happy to commit? And gave them the opportunity to talk about what really wasn't working. Sometimes people will um, go down the, the path of agreeing to everything in the room and then they walk out and go, well, that aren't there because, because. And we were concerned that this would be the case, so that's why we did coaching with everyone. So they could see the whinge and write to me and go, look, I think it's all very well in theory. And I go, theory's got nothing to do with it, my darling. Um, you said you wanted to make it work, what are you going to do about it? And for those who were being, well, there was a bully in this, in this group. It wasn't a man, it was one woman. And, and she was a real bully. She was a real challenge in the group. And so what I was doing, without criticising her in any way, I was giving the others some, um, some feeling of power that they didn't have to tolerate it. I wasn't teaching them to be nasty back to her, but I was saying, uh, believe in yourself and do, are you happy to tolerate that behaviour? Well, now we've come up with a team chart and an agreement of what we're going to do going forward, so let's hold each other to the team charter. One of the questions I was asked, which was interesting, um, and, and it was the, the, the challenging person that asked me this, she said, so what happens if we don't do this, this team charter, if we are agreement? What happens if we don't, you know? And I went, I'm not understanding the question. Well, well, if we don't, you know, will we get the sack? And I said, this is your team charter. What do you think will happen if oh, well, we might get in trouble or this might happen. And I went back to the sheets on the, on the butcher's paper that had the list of how they were now and how they, what caused the call morale. And I went back to the sheet and I went, see this? This is what you'll still have. So it's about consequences. There's a lot of talk on the television this morning, I'm not mad on sports, but gee, should um, the cricket coach have told those guys and they're minimising the whole... I'm hearing it, thinking, you know what? We're Australians, we're going, oh, this isn't fair, it's not allowed to play. The coach went, our team's not functioning, I want your thoughts on how we go forward, and they wouldn't. They didn't take it seriously. You know? So Gary mentioned it to me this morning, and I went, way to go, coach. I'll be careful what arena I'll say that to <laughs> But just in this room, <laughs> deal with me later. So in this case, we didn't do the supervisor training. What we did was we worked with the individuals and got them to agree. We empowered them. 
And then the, um, we did the second team day. We did the second team day a few weeks ago. And what was interesting was the main bully was 90 minutes late. She was arriving at morning tea time. She sent an email, went in there, got something on. And I thought, who beat you? So I used that time in the morning. I'm a storyteller. And I told a story about a situation. Some of it was true. And uh, <laughs> I told a story about a situation describing how um, some people's behaviour impacts on a whole team and how the team can deal with it. And what I talked to them about was identifying the behaviour. Don't make it about the person, identify the behaviour. And how old is that person's behaviour? What's the age of the behaviour? Is that a 10-year-old having a dummy spit? Is that a 13-year-old nasty little girl? Is that a 16-year-old boy? And if you look at that person and you put a very young age and name the behaviour, it takes the person out of it and you go, I'm not putting up with that. I also said to them, if you had a situation, just so, if you had a situation like that, um, and, or if your daughter had a situation where someone was speaking to them badly and treating them badly, what would you advise them? Oh, well, I'd tell them just ignore it. I wouldn't put up with that. I'd tell them don't put up with that. So that's right. And so that's what we need to do in our own working environment. So it was done in a general roundabout way, but it's a penny drop. Um, we reviewed the issues from last time and they were flat out blown away at how bad they were. I could not believe the different environment with this team. Just because they agreed to say hello to each other and goodbye, and they agreed, oh, the other thing they agreed up in the weekly staff meetings, and the manager was away for two weeks and they still had their meeting. They created their own format for the meeting. They created their own um, way it was going to work, their own rules for it. As I said before, ownership is the key. We need to be able to do that. So they um, they did that and it, it worked really well. I'll tell you what happens when you don't get the manager on board. I um, almost got sideswiped. I would be ambushed, would be another way I would describe, with, with a, a team uh, last year. I was, uh, I, I had a phone call with the manager of the team and uh, the team had really big problems. And I had a phone call with the manager of the team and he laid it out. And he said, I want to talk to you further about this, but I want to include the supervisor in on our call, on, a, on a conference call. So, and he'll be able to tell you the real issues, but I also want to make sure he's on board with what we're doing, no problem. So I had a phone call with the two of them and the supervisor laid it out, this one does this, this one does that, we've got four this, four that, he bagged the whole team. And guess what happened when we got in the room? We go into the, so I thought, I was walking into the room, the manager didn't go on this day because he felt they needed to, they had a lot of issues with him. But what was happening is it was the supervisor that was passing poor information down. The manager was actually a good person, but the supervisor was the toxic person in the team. So it goes to work. Before. I'm going to do the day before the training day. It's about quarter to six on Friday night. I don't know about you guys, but I have glasses ready in my hand by quarter to six on Friday night. Our office is at home. Our home number is the same as our office number. And uh, yeah, yes, quarter to six at night, glass of wine. Um, hello. <laughs> What's this team day we're having? Excuse me? This woman tore my head off. I'd never met her. She wasn't the supervisor, she was one of the staff. But what she had been told by the supervisor about the team day, she got her knickers in such a twist. She got onto my website and read that we were, I do, I'm a dysfunctional team specialist, read that. <laughs> and she said, I had to look up the word dysfunctional, and that's not what we are. <laughs> she said, I'm not sleeping. Uh, I'm very stressed about this and everyone's upset and I don't think they're going to come. And I went, whoa, whoa. For starters, you've run me out of working hours and I normally don't talk to people about work out of working hours, but you're very concerned, so I'll talk to you. Why are you getting so stressed about this? What do you think I'm going to do? So I'm doing, our normal thing is to jump to the defensive. I just start asking questions. Someone wants to back me to a corner, I just ask questions. More questions, I should be the lawyer actually. I'm the questions. So I cop this from her. Then I go.
go into the training room and this guy, um, the supervisor, he said, oh, before you start, okay, so I start to do the little intro, here's who I am, I'll the ground rules of the day, phones, no talking with someone else's ball, no, day it all out. He said, oh, before you start, I just have something I need to read. And I thought, oh, okay, and that often happens, the supervisor just needs to let staff know something that's happening. Got a six page document about issues within the team and he wanted to read the whole thing to me and have a guarantee from me that I wouldn't say this and I wouldn't do this and we will not be doing this. He had this list of rules on the first page and I had to sign this piece of paper of what I will or won't do. And so that's how it started. And I'm looking at it thinking, are you the Barry I spoke to on the phone? You know, it was, it was quite bizarre. So it took me half an hour to get it on board. I walked over and I got his sheet and I said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, you, you need to read that before you start. And I went, no. Nah. And I put it on the desk. I totally ignored it. I went, here's what's going to happen. Barry, this is your day. This is the team's day. I'm running it. Here's what's going to happen. Inside, I had a couple of screen words around my head. Um, they never come out of my mouth and try to bust it. And I'm like, serious? You know? And um, it, it, it was a challenge. And he had whipped the team up into a frenzy about this day. He, the untruths he had told about what was going to happen when he had been on the phone and agreed to what we were going to do on the day. Interestingly enough, Barry's not the supervisor of that team anymore. <laughs> Barry, as we talked before, some people have high technical skills. Older chap, brilliant technical skills, they've moved him. They've promoted someone who, not the one who ran me, but uh, they've promoted another person to become supervisor. Um, and uh, he, he had been squashing and he'd been blaming the manager won't let you have the role, you know. And then you face this. So, so that was the, the challenge that we had. She's now running the team. The team morale is over the moon and they are functioning really well. Team morale of the, um, the guys for the, uh, the original group that I worked with had gone from a 2.8 up to a 6 when we met a few weeks ago. And they were so proud of themselves. And then what they did is we created team values. And they got very excited about their team values and then they discussed how they were going to put them out. But again, it's the ownership. All the way through, you need to have people own it because they can't wait for it to be HR's problem. Let's plop it on your lap. HR is the necessary evil in the organisation. You don't even make money for them. You know, in commercial, you don't make any money for them. So what happens is they, they don't want to follow the procedures you put in place. They don't want to do the things that you recommend but um, they'll come to you if there's a problem. And by the time they come to you, the problem is so huge. Some of the, the common reasons for dysfunction you've got on your hand out there. Lack of role clarity is one of the big ones. Lack of structure and informal communication across upwards and downwards. Tolerance of poor performance. Tolerance of poor behaviours. Lack of understanding of or adherence to organisational values. No team values. You can have the organisational values, but at times you need to have a team charter, some team values, some agreements going forward. Um, ineffective leadership, no accountability, lack of understanding of individual working styles, skills gaps, lack of team goals, lack of team ownership of problems and solutions. Can you think of any others? Okay, so today's not quite as interactive. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to use the next five minutes, our uh, final five minutes, to, to go and, and restate some of the things that HR can do in this situation. The first one is to be confident. Be confident. You know the stuff and, and show that you're confident. And sometimes you have to show that confidence to management a lot of the time. It's not necessarily to the staff, but you need to show your confidence to management because you need to get them on board. And it's frustrating for you because a lot of the time you can see what's coming, I'm sure, and you flag it and you flag
play again and it's ignored. You you, you need to, to become more confident in assertive, passing it up. From here I can say Kelly said that as well. Um, be real and name the problem. One of the things I love about Susan Scott's book is it's all about naming the problem. Being real. It's not apportioning blame. It's here's our problem. What can we do to fix it? Let's not spend days and weeks and months talking about how we got here. We're here. We can't go back and change any of that. All we can do is look at how do we move forward from here. I've actually had an activity that I've used a couple of times where I'll take a sheet of paper that has a photo of the beach. There's a lot of sand on the beach, a photo of the beach. And I'll give them some little um, feet, drawing of feet and coloured pencils. And I don't tell them what's going to give them the feet. Colour in the pencils, design the perfect feet, you know, make it fun, whatever. And then I get them the beautiful beach feet, stick it on the piece of paper where you'd like to be on that beach right now. All right, grab your pen, draw a line across the back of the wheels. We've drawn a line in the sand, we're moving forward, we can't go backwards, we only have this moment right now. And in organisations going through lots of change, you can't go forward and worry too much what's going to happen here, because there's a lot of it we still don't know. What we have, as I said before, Charlotte, we'll talk about suffering, we only have right now the present. So what can we do today? Not next week, what should we have done six months ago? Right now. Um, gain consensus from everyone that it needs to be fixed. You have to get the key players on board. I have a bit of a, 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 bit of a phrase that I use a lot in the training. Um, if in doubt, ask a question and then ask more questions. And by you asking the questions, you actually make people accountable. And if they make a flippant comment, make them accountable for that comment. You know, oh, no one here cares about me. Do you really believe in that? Give me some examples. You know, drill down. Um, be consistent. And that's the thing that takes energy and you'll find it's quite exhausting at times. But be consistent. Create the space to have the difficult conversations. Don't avoid them, but create a space where you have the real conversations. As I've already said, you need to make sure all of the leaders at all of the levels are on board, but make sure they have adequate training in having the conversations. Usually not something we're taught how to have how to deal with conflict. We send people to conflict resolution courses, but they often don't know how to have the real conversation. And my final point: follow up, follow up, and don't be blown off. Just keep following up. They come to you with a problem with their team, and. Um, and then you, you hear the broken record, you make suggestions, recommendations, what they can do, and then they don't do any of that, they're back in your office three weeks later, and they're back in your office three months after that, and have you done any of this? Follow up. Be, you know, like a little snapping dog. Make people accountable. I have also included in the handouts uh, something that I use. I adapted it from um, one of the trading games books. So I've added some of my own points in there. It's, it's a very handy tool to use looking at a team checklist. It's something I'll often do on the second day. If they sit there and say everything's fine now, then I get them to drill down. And then from here you can look at the areas that aren't working. And it's a really good one for that confidence in management or leadership skills of the team. <coughs> Look, I'll, I'll, I'll be, be honest, it, it 
it often works, what I do works well because there's a third person there doing it. Yeah. But what I what I was wanted to do today was to give you some things that you may be able to do yourself. Yeah. Uh, when it gets to the really pear shape, like some of these, these teams that I talked about today, the case studies today, when they get to that stage, it's probably past anything that you can do yourself, so you need to, to probably bring someone in. But sometimes HR can be the third person if it's not your team. And, and I've worked with plenty of HR teams that have had challenges as well. I also, I don't just work with dysfunctional teams, I work with teams that have burnt out, you know, from dealing with all of this stuff. But, but sometimes HR can be the third person. Other questions? Yeah, uh, one thing is, uh, in the history of managed managers and supervisors, sometimes I've worked with organisations where it's actually right at the very time. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? Um, it's, it's tough, but if, if you need to deal with the very top, you need to speak in the person at the top's language. So if the person at the top is has allowed this toxic environment because of their leadership style, because their primary focus isn't on the people, isn't on the culture, uh, the primary focus is on numbers, then you, then you put it down into numbers and you speak to them in the language that they talk um, you have to be frank. You have to get you have to get lots of evidence, and you need to put, put the strong case forward. Again, Harry, the values can come in handy. Most organisations have values or a mission statement. They'll be floating about somewhere, as I said, in, in, in you know, um, a book or a hallway somewhere. Bring it back to the values and, and ask the question. It's not always easy. I'll admit. You know, I don't. I don't magic one as far as those go. But, but if you can put your hand on your heart and know that you've done everything humanly possible and, and gain some support with other management, you know, try and bring them on board. Um, what do you say is that if you're going to do a morale style once it's out, there are five. So I that that's on the side of the work that we can do on the side. If you're a three, you can't have two. Um, no, I've had some that have come back at six. But they come back with, they want it to be a nine. And that's why I do the two numbers. Here's what we are. People usually don't go, we're a six, we want it to be a six. People want it to be better. And I don't, as I said, I don't always do the morale thing. If the team's not too bad, and sometimes the boss will tell me, look, the team's like our HR setup, they've just been through a lot of change, they get some value. Or some organisations will do a team day for one of their teams and it's been successful, dysfunctional teams, so they'll do it for all their teams and so they've all got the opportunity. So some of the teams are, might have a big problem, but it's funny when you when you do the other thing of maybe doing um, what um, what sort of team, what would be the perfect working environment for you? Now there'd be a few jokes where we'd have spa or this and that, you know, hot cold running alcohol or something, you know. But but in between that, that the fun stuff that they'll put up there, you'll actually find what they really want to have happen. You know, it might be that they will always say, um, with all the people I work with all the teams and everyone else who's ever been a trainer, you will always find they want better communication. Would you agree, Michelle? Yeah. They want better communication. So that can be a basis. So if they say they want better communication, maybe morale isn't bad because it, it would come back as a five or a six. Maybe what you do is go, what, what are our communication challenges currently? You know, well, the old what's working, what isn't? And so, so that's what you Um, in your second case, like you mentioned there, that there were some unofficial claims and processes. Yep. There were some really strong emotions that were being Yeah. How did you deal with that? that kind of surface? It certainly came to the surface because one of the, um, the, the particularly strong uh, personality in that team um, liked to play the racist card, and she, she, she loosely accused me of being a racist. And so um, she, she was quite, it was quite volatile. Okay. So she, she implied that I was, I was a racist. And, um, and, and I said, I'm terribly sorry if anything that I've said today has offended you. Um, so I would really be guided by you as to, to what, what I, I can do differently. Now there was none of that. Again, 
making her accountable. She plopped it out there, you know. Well, I realised it was going to be um, a white training session. I said, oh, is that due to the colour of my skin? No, just your approach to things. It's not a career session. And I said, you know, well, what, what would make it a career session? You know, and do we actually think it to be a career session? I, I want to be very I'm culturally sensitive regardless of what group I'm working with. I try to be, so what is it that I'm not doing? And then what was interesting is a couple of the quieter girls on the other side of the room, and she was an older woman who wanted to play the, the card. Um, then a couple of the younger ones went, well, why do we have to be different? You know, so she challenged The thing I find is most people, if they're going to do something like that, there's usually only one, one or two. And if you create the right environment, the others will feel strong enough to go, well, hang on a minute, why should we? But, but there, there were some real issues. So I just went, so how would you like it to be different? And she, she made a comment about something that I did, and she made it later in the day, um, something that I, I did in the morning. And she said, you know, well, I just figured, you know, we did that, and I wasn't very happy. And I said, so if it was that important to you, why would you mention If something, if this, if this is such, such a passion for you, and it's a driver for you, and it's so important for your culture, it's why didn't you challenge me at the time? Again, it's, it's getting people to be accountable as well. 
So I guess you um, shared with me in having gone through a nice journey with Kelly into a couple of teams that needed some help. And I guess the, the notes that I've taken away that really resonate with me are having your own sense of values and knowing them and sticking to them and being honest, but also making sure you understand where that aligns and resonates with your company's values. Don't be scared. We do need to be fearless. Um, and, and one of my favourite sayings, which isn't the words Kelly used, but don't take the monkey off their back. I actually said to someone last week, you need to find the zookeeper because I'm not taking your monkey. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important. We need to facilitate, not there to fix the problem, and that's just great to hear um, coming through. Holding people to account and being straight and consistent with that as well. Importantly, Einstein's words, we need to be or act differently to get a different result. And again, we have to help people understand that that's what they need to do as well. And asking questions, I love it. Having been to a few sessions on coaching and taking that approach, we don't need to have all the answers. It's helping people discover the right answer for them. I've certainly found the, um, the talk inspiring and motivating, reaffirming in a sense, um, at a time in my career where I'm new in a role and go, I just need to, something to step in and have the rudder there. It's been wonderful. Please join me in 